Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Nell Robinson, and I'm the chair for the Division of Education Administration here at Mayo Clinic. And I'm really excited to share with you um, some a surprise in a moment. Right now, Dr. Um, Vivek Gupta, who was a physician champion for this project, is not here yet, and I trust it's because he's taking care of patients. And because we're a patient care institution, that's always the right thing to do first. So, but we're not going to, we, we appreciate that everyone has, has given up their time today to come listen to these students present what they've been doing with us. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the process was pretty uh, interesting. This is a first um, of its kind in the Mayo Clinic Florida campus, collaboration with Georgia Tech and Mayo Clinic, where we've had uh, uh, engineering students come spend a semester inventing something. And I'm going to let them share uh, the details about what they've done. But we kind of had a contest, if you will, among our physicians to say, who has a really good idea and would like to have these um, bright students from Georgia Tech come and help uh, invent, envision what the future of medicine might look like. And so we paired the students with the physicians, and they're going to describe for you the magic that happened as a result. So um, I don't know, Dr. Raines, if you'd like to come up and maybe introduce your students, or maybe he says no. So maybe the students would like to introduce themselves. Um, uh, yeah. well, we're being recorded, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to come so up. OK. Come up and say something. So first of all, I just want to thank Larry Huang for uh, starting this whole idea and reaching out to Georgia Tech so that we can work with Mayo. It's a great opportunity. And as you'll see today, the students have done a fantastic job. You'll be able to see about the contributions that they were able to really get from the Mayo people uh, and then working together to create this great thing. Uh, I do also want to mention that it is an interdisciplinary group. Uh, I represent the biomedical engineering program, but they're from the mechanical engineering as well as biomedical engineering. Um, and there's not really much more to add, so I'll let you guys take it. Thank you for having us. We are Neuroline, and we are incredibly excited to be here. So my name is Dev Mandavia, and joining me are four other very impassionate uh, entrepreneurs and engineers. And between us, we have a very diverse background, ranging across the breadth of medical device innovation and entrepreneurship and also product development. Assisting us are our incredible advisors, some of which I'm sure you recognize. Um, and they've provided invaluable feedback and guidance throughout the whole steps of the process. So together, uh, this collaboration allowed I mean, the number one biomedical engineering program and also the number one hospital system in the nation to work together and really create a solution to a real clinical need. And the premise of the project itself was forming around uh, the interdisciplinary capstone program we have uh, as part of our senior design project. And the uh, goal of it is really to work with a sponsor to identify a problem that exists, understand its users' needs, and then ideate through different types of uh, prototypes and create a real solution that can actually be brought to these users. Now, the project that we were presented was the placement of intrathecal and intravenous needles uh, at the bedside. And this was after choosing uh, between a range of different projects that were submitted from the different doctors at Mayo Clinic. Uh, but the first step we wanted to take was to really assess the scope of the project. Uh, and then from there, determine what was the uh, biggest opportunity for innovation and impact. And to do that, we really wanted to get a very diverse uh, perspective of how this problem pervaded across different types of hospital systems. So we've uh, done interviews at over nine different types of hospitals, ranging from uh, private practices to nonprofits and uh, institutions for education, and done over 200 interviews and observations in the last six months alone. And from those, we've learned that the greatest opportunity for innovation and impact existed in the market for labor and delivery. Right. And so let's look a little bit more of this background information of labor and delivery and see why it has such a big opportunity for innovation. Now, it's mainly because of those two reasons. One is because it's an extremely large population that's impacted. In fact, every year in the United States alone, four million women give birth. And of this number, at least half of them will elect to receive some form of anesthesia to help alleviate the pain of childbirth. And two, one of the hard reasons to do this is because placing a needle is extremely difficult. Physicians have to be able to insert a five-inch needle through a pea-sized hole and know the exact depth when they need to spot. 
need to stop, meaning that they're in the epidural space. But the problem with this is that it's done without image guidance because radiation can cause harmful effects to the baby. And so instead, and after these 200 interviews that we did, we really broke the procedure down into two different steps. One is palpation. The physician palpates the back of the spine to find an optimal entry location. And two, they then insert the needle and use a technique called lobster resistance in order to identify that epidural space. But there are a lot of problems with these two steps. In fact, patients who are obese or who have any anatomical abnormalities, such as scoliosis, make this procedure even that more challenging. And secondly, loss of resistance has an extremely high failure rate, meaning that the physician can never be 100% certain that even if they are in the epidural space, that it is correct. And so there are a lot of effects to this. For one, we've witnessed procedures last up to two hours, resulting in multiple needle stick attempts. I don't know about you, but I don't want one needle stick in my back, let alone two, three, four, or five. There's also a very high complication rate. In fact, one out of every eight women will experience some sort of complication, which can include debilitating headaches, backaches, and in severe cases, paralysis, and death. And so why does this matter? There are a lot of stakeholders for this. As I just mentioned about the complications, they total up to 300,000 every single year totaling a cost of $90 million that the hospitals have to absorb in complication costs and malpractice claims. And for physicians, this means that there's $110 million due to inefficiencies and bottlenecks that is time and money that is wasted. And not only is this just restricted to labor and delivery, but extends to 12.7 million other procedures, including diagnostics, other neuroaxial anesthesia um, procedures, as well as pain management. And with $400 per procedure, we found a total of $5 billion total attainable market, really showing the magnitude of this problem. Yeah, so it's pretty clear from the market analysis we did that hospitals are losing a fairly substantial amount of money from not only the complications, but also the productivity losses that physicians incur from this procedure. And in order to create an effective solution, we wanted to understand exactly which problem within this procedure was most, most, most directly tied to these losses. Um, and as Marcy explained, we broke the procedure down into its two major components, the initial positioning and orienting of the needle, and then the final confirmation. And each step has problems associated with it. Um, in that initial positioning, the problem is just the ineffectiveness as palpation uh, as a means of identifying that initial entry point. And in confirmation, uh, what you see is the introduction of anesthetic into the body, which poses the risk of injecting anesthetic into the wrong space, which is really where all the complications in this procedure arise from, which ultimately um, is the reason why we chose to focus on this second problem. We spent a lot of time going back and forth between the hospitals and the physicians to try and understand not only what the values of these OB anesthesiologists were, but uh, the frustrations that they were having with current techniques and what they really wanted to see out of a solution in this space. And ultimately what it came down to is that above everything else, these physicians wanted to improve uh, the safety in these procedures as well as maximize their efficiency. And we generated dozens of different user needs from the interviews we did and ultimately boiled it down to three core, value, or three core needs that we thought best addressed the solution that they wanted uh, us to provide. And so the first being, of course, ensuring patient safety. And the only way to do that is to make sure that you can reduce the incidence of misplacement of anesthetic, which is where all these complications come from. From there, physicians continuously stress to us the importance of saving time in these procedures. Something we noticed is that, especially in the labor and delivery department, it's extremely unpredictable how many patients you'll have. And so it's, it's common for them to be overwhelmed by sudden spikes in patient volume. Lastly, Something we notice not specifically with physicians, but more so with residents and teaching institutions, is how difficult it is to learn the current technique of loss of, of, loss of resistance, which is currently how they confirm placement of epidurals. And any solution in this space, they told us, make sure you really minimize the time that you spend trying to learn this. Because we, they've, been, uh, they've been quoted multiple times telling us that it takes up to 100, maybe more, practice epidurals in order to actually learn this technique. And keep in mind that those practice epidurals, they're done on real people. Uh, there's no training model for any of this. But at the end of the day, the device has to deliver. And in order to benchmark our performance and really figure out what we wanted to provide, uh, we had to compare it to loss of resistance. Now, loss of resistance is, struggles with a number of problems. Um, it has an 11% false, uh, false negative rate. Essentially what that means is that 
11% of the times that these procedures are performed, uh, physicians will actually reach the epidural space but not get any form of confirmation. So they won't actually know that they're there. Loss of resistance also suffers from a 30 to 60% uh, false positive rate, which means that they'll get confirmation outside of the epidural space. So they, they'll think that they're there, but they're not actually there. And so ultimately, that allowed us to generate the sensitivity and specificity that we wanted our final device to achieve. We spent a few weeks really trying to come up with all the different ideas and technologies and approaches we could use to solve this problem, and ended up coming up with over 100 of these, just throwing designs at the wall, to, uh, trying to figure out what would stick. And once we had done this and exhausted our creativity, we allowed ourselves to look back into the competitive landscape and see what other people had done to try and address this problem. And it's pretty interesting. There's a number of startups that have begun looking into um, spinal access in general, but really only three, namely uh, Ravana, Echo Spine, and Compass up here, have looked into labor and delivery at all. And only one of these devices is actually on the market right now and FDA cleared, that's the Ravana Acura, but they haven't seen any sort of widespread adoption. And from what we gather, uh, looking deeper into these companies is that most of their products are stemming out of research. And so it seems that they're fitting a product to a market rather than letting the user needs and the actual problem um, define their solution. And so ultimately what we concluded is that those three startups that are competing in this space, they're, they're creating devices that um, for one seem to be more expensive than what hospitals are willing to pay for, more obtrusive than what physicians have told us they're willing to accommodate in their practice, and in many cases, not efficacious enough to even justify adoption over current techniques. So after we did that competitive landscaping, we did a little bit deeper dive and did some intellectual property landscaping. We were trying to assess whether or not our idea would be patentable and, free to, and have freedom to operate. Because one of the most important things for us is that our product would actually get into the hands of users. So once we were done with that, we began to try to sift through the 100 concepts that we had come up with. And the way we did that was we came up with six questions. And we asked ourselves these questions to try to figure out which, one, which of our concepts would be the best. So the first was, how does it work? So to design a system to implement a technology to actually solve something, we have to really understand how it works. So yeah. The next one was the potential implications or methods of implementation. So how exactly could we implement this device and make it work in the real world? The third is, how is this device actually used in the real world right now, both in medical and non-medical applications? Using this device or examining this device in other applications could help us come up with a way to implement our own. The fourth was limitations. So in what cases could this not be used? For example, x-ray, in the case of labor and delivery, can never be used because we can't expose the child to radiation. The next one is system requirements. So what kind of components can't be used in our specific application? Or certain components could be too expensive or too heavy or too large to be used. And the last one was testing mode. So how could we come up with a way to specifically test our device? And this is what we came up with next. We had, three, we had two main prototype methods. So the first is a force sensing needle. And that's the one on the far left. And the second is the bio impedance sensing needle. And those are the two on the right. Now, Georgia Tech provides excellent prototyping resources for us. Um, 3D printers, we made printed circuit boards. And that's really important to us because we have to rapidly prototype and test those prototypes. Every time we make a new prototype, we learn something from it. And we continue to iteratively improve on each prototype as we move through the process and run through simple tests. And this is what we finally came up with. Our device measures bioimpedance at the needle tip. It uses what's called a bipolar implementation, which means that there's two electrodes right at the needle tip. One is actually the stylet in the needle. The other is the needle itself. And it passes a small alternating current to measure the bioimpedance. Now, the different tissue layers have different bioimpedances. So we could elucidate exactly which tissue layer we're in from that. Our device is seamlessly integrates with current needles. So it uses the same connection that the normal needle used in any epidural right now uses, so that it fits seamlessly right into current practice. And we made different stylets to serve different needles. So you can plug any of our stylets into our electronics packaging, and it'll work. And finally, it provides instant and intuitive feedback to the physician on where exactly their needle is located in the tissues using these LEDs. And it's lightweight and unobtrusive. So it's three times lighter than the current loss of resistance syringe and about the same size. 
Now, the changes we made from iter iteration to iteration that eventually landed us where we are now uh, were founded on uh, the results from several stages of testing that informed us about the usability and the functional performance of each design. So uh, when we first decided to take on bioimpedance as our modality for measurement, uh, we needed to find a way to test our prototypes on some sort of tissue analog that somewhat accurately replicated the electrical characteristics of human tissue. Uh, ultimately, what we came up with was a layered gelatin model where each layer of jello contained a different concentration of salt. And using reference values obtained through literature, we were able to closely match those uh, electrical conductivities with actual human tissue values. So, for example, fat and ligament and CSF. Now, these jello tests were very important for us. Uh, they allowed us to uh, determine actually what kind of design configuration we would go with. And here we actually have our very first video we took of our first prototype. This one is a bipolar configuration, so it is a needle and stylet electrode, and it's connected to a multimeter that reads out the resistance as we pass through different tissue layers. And uh, as I said before, this was really important for us in pr proving the concept because we showed that, for example, the bipolar mechanism was uh, fairly effective at resolving the differences in conductivities between tissue layers, whereas one of our other ideas, the monopolar design, where we had one uh, skin patch electrode on the surface and one needle tip uh, electrode was not quite as effective at resolving those differences. And moving forward, uh, we started to get a little more excited as we moved into actual uh, uh, cadaver testing. So we used a local testing facility, T3 Labs, uh, who helped us set up a porcine cadaver test. And this was really exciting for us because we actually got to perform the procedure ourselves and get our hands on it. And we got to feel the pop as you enter the uh, dura mater or the, the kind of engagement as you touch the uh, ligamentum flavum. So that was really interesting to us. And we got to kind of feel the challenges associated with this kind of procedure. Uh, now, one of, the, one of the main takeaways from this procedure is uh, ultimately what we want to be able to do is differentiate between tissue layers. So somehow we need to correlate our measurements with tissue location. And even though we had access to uh, fluoroscopic imaging here, uh, we weren't exactly sure where we were. We didn't really know how to interpret the images or the tactile sensations. So although we were getting some sorts of measurable characteristics between tissue layers, we didn't really know what we could match those up to. And that led us to our human cadaver testing. Here, uh, we brought in one of our OB anesthesiologist contacts who actually performed the procedure himself and informed us in real time what tissue layer he believed he was in. So we could mark certain stages within our data uh, when we had entered certain spaces. So this gave us greater degrees of confidence as to uh, what tissue layers we could correlate to certain characteristics within the data sets. Uh, ultimately, oh, here is uh, actually a live video of him performing the procedure, and you can see in the bottom left uh, a live view of the graph changing in uh, measured impedance. So ultimately what we found is, uh, based on our current implementation, we are pretty conclusively able to tell the difference between uh, subarachnoid space or the cerebrospinal fluid and other tissue types. And this is kind of to be expected because CSF has a much higher conductivity than a lot of other tissue types. Uh, one challenge remains in identifying the epidural space. Uh, one of the primary challenges with this is it's, it's fairly difficult to determine when we've actually entered the epidural space. It's hard to see it through a fluoroscopy. And while we're taking these measurements, we can't exactly use that loss of resistance technique to check. Um, so the culmination of all of our semester's efforts of research and design and prototyping was the Capstone Design Expo. And this actually occurred last Tuesday. And this was a unique opportunity for us to show off what we had done and share what we had learned with other people uh, in the tech, uh, Georgia Tech community. And we actually got a lot of support from anesthesiologists who came by our booth and said, we really believe you're working on a meaningful problem here. We heard stories from patients and family members and friends who had their own uh, stories of epidural anesthesia kind of uh, failing them in certain ways. So it was really meaningful to us, and it gave us encouragement that we're solving something that was uh, truly be uh, beneficial to other people. That being said, we do have a long road ahead of us. Uh, for three of us, that means graduation tomorrow. Um, it also means it's coming summer. We are taking on this project as a startup company using, uh, in Georgia Tech's very own startup launch program. And this summer, one of our primary objectives is to continue development and move toward live animal testing. Uh, as I'm sure you can all imagine, the, the data we would expect to see in a live animal would be probably much different from a cadaver. So it would be really interesting to see here what kind of differences we observe. Um, at the end of the summer, our aggressive target is to be ready for the uh, FDA 510K approval process. Further down the road, we're looking at clinical trials so we can give physicians and hospitals the confidence they need to be able to adopt their product. 
and even beyond the scope of our project. We want this to be, this collaboration between Mayo and Georgia Tech uh, to be something that's available to other groups and other students who are passionate about making a difference in the lives of other people. It's been an enormous uh, learning experience for us being able to engage with uh, clinical experts uh, and on a regular basis learn from them and uh, the, the opportunity for other students to be able to engage in this process as well and provide value to other clinicians in other fields would just be enormous and would really greatly improve patient outcomes around the world. And at this point, we would actually like to give a special thanks to Marlena Beck for making all of our efforts possible this semester. <laughs> and of course, to our uh, three wonderful clinical advisors, and especially to Larry Huang and uh, Dr. Bruce, without whom this uh, opportunity would